Some of you are alive and remember uh, when President John F. Kennedy uh, was assassinated. I'm not old enough to remember that, although it was very much present uh, in my personal experiences, uh, hearing about it through school, hearing my teachers talk about they remembered where they were when that event happened. Uh, But the legacy of John F. Kennedy uh, is something that still goes on to this day. And one of the reasons that he had influence was because of a book that he wrote while he was still serving as a senator. In 1956, he released the book Profiles in Courage. It detailed in that book the story of eight U.S. senators that had been serving in the United States throughout its history, starting with John Quincy Adams and Daniel Webster, then going on to Thomas Hart Benton, Sam Houston from Texas, Edmund G. Ross, Lucius Lamar, George Norris, and Robert Taft. I thought it was interesting, even in just reviewing this and and getting ready for the message this morning, that Kennedy, though a a profound Democrat and still somebody who his family has that legacy uh, even today, was writing about these different senators and speaking of them in positive ways across party lines. You have uh, Quincy Adams, for example, John Quincy Adams is his episode of demonstrating courage was to leave the Federalist Party and to begin the Republican Party, uh, for example. And and you're going through some of these different issues uh, that were present throughout history. And what he was trying to do, even as he was working with a team of writers, to further his idea that we can compromise our political positions, but not ourselves. We have to be true to our character. Now, Maybe we would say somewhat cynically, we look back on his life and we see some of the details, the sordid things that have come out of his life, or even in how the book was comprised. There was one critic who shortly after the book was out uh, and Kennedy had interviewed with Mike Wallace on ABC News, he says, he's the first one to get a Pulitzer Prize for a book he's ever, he ghost wrote, <laughs> that he had other people contributing uh, to these things. And that's part of the history of this too. But what we want to understand, for our purposes here, is that he was, in this, highlighting the courageous acts of others. People who stood up under difficulty, under duress, but remained true to what they believed, true to who they were. I would say that as we look to the text this morning, we certainly see there is a time and a place for us to do that as followers of Jesus Christ. But it is even something that we would say has a commentary on how we should be functioning as a society. And we'll see how some of those things apply to us today as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ in the context that we live in. Because we will see for ourselves here in the text of Scripture a model of consistency of faithfulness under extreme duress. Paul is here been arrested. We've been following through. If you've come with us week after week as we've made our way through the book of Acts, we saw last week Paul was arrested. He gave for himself an eloquent defense in the court of public opinion. And now he is under trial with the Jewish leaders. And in the face of open attack, open hostility, he serves as a model to how we should carry ourselves, how we should conduct ourselves and show courage under fire. So let's look at Acts chapter 22, beginning in verse 30. I'm reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of God. Luke writes, On the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, this is talking here about the Roman uh, tribunal, the one who's the, the Roman leader. He releases Paul, unbinds him, and commands the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought down Paul and set him before them. So before the Jewish council. He's in Roman custody, but he's on trial by Jewish leaders. So picking up in verse 1 of chapter 23. And looking at, intently at the council, Paul says, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? 
and yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. But the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. As you look on that outline on the back of your worship guide, you'll notice that first of all, as we've said the title of the message, we're in the text, the first point that we're building on here, how God is portrayed in this text, is God is Paul's helper. And God is now, we're learning, our helper as well. He serves in this capacity to Paul and then to us in three different and specific ways. He helps us in our times of difficulty by providing us, number one, comfort. He shows up here in the last verse that we read in this passage this morning. Jesus shows him up in person. It says there in the text of Scripture that the Lord stood by him. That is, there was a physical manifestation, a physical appearance by Jesus to Paul to speak to him. Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so also you must testify in Rome. We understand that this is something that Paul has had an extreme desire to do. He sees this coming, but as convicted as he was, now he's starting to undergo real opposition. There's people speaking against him. The reality is he's cut off from his friends, from those who are supporting him during this time, and all he's getting exposure to are Romans who are holding him in custody and probably not treating him very well. And then he's being exposed to the Jewish leaders who are striking him, who are opposing him. They're arguing, and there's a lot of contention, a lot of conflict and division. From a human standpoint, Paul has experienced a lot of these kind of things, yes, but to this point in the narrative, God has always orchestrated events so he could be removed from these things. Whether he's escaping his followers with the help of others, or, or whether God is moving him on to other places where he's seeing conversions and, and accolades and responses, God miraculously delivers him time and again, but not now. So Jesus realizes in the time of his weakness, in the time of his being cut off, that he needs reassurance. He needs comfort. And the very visible, very real presence of Jesus Christ is made available to him in a miraculous way. Now, is that something you and I can expect, anticipate? We don't have any record of Scripture assuring us that those things are going to take place. Any more than Paul had an expectation that this was going to take place. But what do we know? What promises do we have in Scripture? We know that Jesus himself has said in Hebrews 13, verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so going to the Psalms, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The author of Hebrews is reminding us that that is something real. That is something tangible. That is accessible to us in our times of griefs, sorrows, 
confusions, worries, and doubt, Jesus promises, I will not abandon you. I will be there with you. Like we sang this morning, when I fear that my faith will fail, Christ holds us close to Himself. It's not talking fast in a manner of speed. It's talking fast, close. I'm not going to let you go. This is the idea that we see portrayed for us in Scripture. God is our comforter in difficulty, an ever-present help. We can always relieve ourselves of our burdens, cares, and anxieties. Why? Because Jesus has promised to bear them. He says in 1 Peter 5, uh, chapter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves, Peter says, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time, He can lift you up from that low place. He can exalt you. So how do we respond in that moment? We take our burdens. We take our anxieties and cares and we cast them on Him. Because He always cares for you. He has not forgotten you. He knows your struggles. He knows your anxieties. Hebrews tells us in another place, He empathizes with with our weaknesses in every point in every way he has been tempted like you he knows what you're going through and that helps he's not giving you advice that is uninformed because he doesn't have the whole picture he's not telling you to just buck up he's there experiencing the pain the betrayal the hurt the disappointment. He knows what that's like. And He can identify with you. He can help you bear that load. That's the kind of comfort that Jesus Christ brought to Paul. And friend, that's the kind of comfort He can bring to you. He also, in this passage, demonstrates Himself not only to be a comfort, but to be a counselor. Counselor can mean all kinds of different things in our vernacular and how we use it. We might think of the high school student going and consulting his guidance counselor on where he's going to go for college and what his career and vocational options are. And that guidance counselor can offer uh, his services or her services as a sounding board, giving not really any authoritative direction, but just saying, here's your options. Here's are some things you think through. And I see some of these possibilities in you. You'd be really good for this or you'd be really good for that. But telling that person, telling you what you might do, what the possibilities and opportunities are. A counselor can help you if you're going through times of crisis and times of dep deprivation and loss. Might help you sort through the falling out of a failed relationship to help you deal with the devastation of a death or significant loss. Counselor can also be somebody that you hire. Maybe we call them more in our American culture a lawyer, but what do they, how they are often address in the courtroom setting? They'll, they'll talk to them as a counselor. Why? Because they are experienced and grounded in the law. And yes, they are taking charge of your case, because they're there to help you navigate through these things to see that this situation is resolved to your best advantage. They're there to give you hope in what can be a very confusing and difficult situation. All of these things help us understand how Jesus comforts us. Jesus was not just giving comfort, but he was counseling. He was directing Paul, assuring him that the direction that he was pursuing was, yes, the correct course of action. Look back again in verse 11. It says the following night, the Lord Jesus stood by him and said, take courage. So be encouraged, be comforted. You have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, and you're going to do the same thing in Rome. I'm giving you a specific direction, a specific confirmation that the, the path that you are walking is the one you should be walking. And what that reminds us of, just like Paul is getting that kind of assurance, brothers and sisters, God will give us that kind of direction as we listen to his voice, as we hear him speak through his word. 
the, the author of Proverbs, Solomon says in Proverbs 3, verse 6, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Another translation says it, He'll direct your paths. He's going to open up the way before you to make that clear. And the alternative is in verse 5. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own instincts. Question your desires. Question and be skeptical of what you want to do. Allow God instead to get, let you shape your heart. Change your desires. Change to match what He sees is going to be best for you. When you are feeling aimless and confused, He will give you counsel. He will give you direction. And how do we find that? James says it's through prayer. James 1.5 If any of you lacks wisdom, you're confused. You don't know what to do. It feels like I should do this. What should I do? You pause. It says, let him ask God who generously gives to all without reproach. And God will give you wisdom. He will give you direction. He will let His Word shape you. He will let His Spirit give you that positive direction. You don't have to go through life trying to figure it out by trial and error. God says, I will give you the wisdom when you seek after it. I will let you know what you should do, how you should live. But remember, friend, the way that He's going to do that is we have to humble ourselves. We have to say, yes, you are God. And everything on the inside that I'm saying I want to do that feels right in this situation that I think is going to be satisfying, I've got to analyze that in the light of what God has said. I've got to analyze that and evaluate that in how God wants me to live. So, my relationship that I'm struggling with, maybe I'm going through conflict and difficulty with my spouse, and there are, there are things there that I, I have to sort through. What do I have to value? What are my priorities here? So yes, God wants your happiness. God wants your fulfillment. But He also wants, husbands, He wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be investing in your wife's benefit. Making sacrifices. How are you to love your wife, husband? As Christ loved the church and gave Himself. Not saying, well, I'm going to withhold because she's not really doing her end of the thing, so she's treating me this way, I'm going to treat her this way. Give her back a taste of it and, and double it. No. If we want God's wisdom, God's wisdom is going to say, we redouble ourselves to looking after her to caring for her needs that's who we're supposed to be congregation when we come around families like that what do we do we offer support we offer comfort because there are going to be people who haven't upheld their end they haven't lived faithfully and so we must comfort the brokenhearted. We must shelter them. We must find ways. And that's wisdom that God... Let, let them figure out. Let, let clinical psychology and let all these other things take care of them. We're grateful to live in a society that has some of these things figured out. But it's the responsibility of the people of God to care for the church of God. To care for the saints that are hurting. Bear each other's burdens. Share each other's load. Why? This is the law of Christ. This is what He wants us to do. We understand that we can find wisdom, but we need to hear the wisdom so that we can follow through with it. Because not only is Jesus our comfort, not only is He the one who gives us direction, He's the one who is empowering us and enabling us to do that. He is, I'm going to say here, for sake of alliteration, collaborator. He is our collaborator. And how do we see that playing out here in verse 11? Because you are talking, He says, to Paul, again in verse 11, you are speaking my truth. You are representing me. You have testified to the facts about me 
in Jerusalem. This is what I've called you to do. I've given you all the information. Represent it well. I'm empowering you to do so. And it's your responsibility to follow that out. After this morning's uh, Sunday school lesson that Sam so admirably did, but finished with a little time early, we were having conversations. And there's always this tension that goes on when we start delving into theology between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. And some people who are over here emphasizing sovereignty kind of recoil when we start talking about any degree of human responsibility. Amen, George? (laughs) So we were having a good conversation this morning. And when it comes especially to our walk with Christ, we can sometimes get this sense that people over here just say that that you don't really have to, you just have to let go and let God do this. He's going to see it out through to the end. Christian, don't fall into that trap. God does give us a task to fulfill. He does give us a responsibility that we need to follow through. He says even here to Paul, you have testified about me in Jerusalem and you will testify in Rome. You need to do this. This is what I've called you to do. This is the task that I have empowered you to do. He doesn't tell him to step back and just let me handle this. He says, you've got a job to fulfill. Now let's see it go through. And so, Jesus would say this similar to his disciples before he was crucified. And he's talking about their future mission. John 14 and verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to my Father. In other words, I'm equipping them to do them, but they're going to have to make sure that these things get done. There's going to have to be a holy ambition, a divine unction, a sense of purpose that they're going to have to fulfill. Galatians 2.20, Paul says it this way in a verse that we've quoted a couple of times here recently. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So Christ is doing the work. But he now says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, Jesus lived in Paul and he lives in you and me. He empowers us to serve, but we are expected to act. We must realize that we have to have holy initiative. There needs to be in the Christian's life a sense of zeal and fervor for what has, God has equipped us to do. There is no room, friend, for the Christian to be passive about his relationship with Christ or what Christ has called us to do. We must be faithful at the work. This starts with things like gospel proclamation, yes, but it goes over into all the things that we have in our relationships, to being a godly spouse, to being godly parents, to being faithful church members, to be honest and in, have integrity in our dealings, in our, in our work, with our neighbors. With our friends. These are things that God wants us to be actively and intentionally involved in. There is no room to just say these things are going to happen. We are to give ourselves wholly to being a follower of Jesus Christ, to being obedient to what he has set out for us to do. And so don't let that overwhelm you, Jesus says to Paul. There are all these difficulties, there are all these things that are going on, but take heart, have courage, Understand that I have equipped you. And that's the next point on our outline. And so, knowing that I am your comforter, I am your counselor, I am your collaborator, what's upon you? You, Paul, are to be confident. You're to be confident. The comfort that God gives us is not meant to lull us into complacency. A call to take courage is not to be confused with retreating into retirement. Courage is a strength to endure, to continue the fight against long odds and active resistance, like you see Paul doing here, getting into this skirmish, into this verbal confrontation uh, here with the Jewish leaders. And there are places where you might even be able to see, some have said Paul was completely justified in what he has to say. Others say maybe what you see happening here in the early parts of verse 23, that Paul might lose his temper lose control. He gets unrighteously angry. 
I don't know what you would conclude, so some of you who have studied this passage, I tend to think that Paul, if he does act improperly, does so innocently. Uh, Some have said, as you study it here, he is confident in the truth of what he's saying, and so he is animated, we might say. Uh, He is speaking forcefully uh, to what he does, but he doesn't realize in the process that when the high priest Ananias commands him to be struck in the mouth, he doesn't realize who it is. And so he rebukes him sharply, and people call him on it and says, who do you think you are calling out God's high priest? And Paul says, and I believe, because he's not just going to try to whitewash this, he says, I didn't know it was the high priest. So what was happening? Some have, some have speculated maybe what Ananias does is he doesn't verbally say, strike him on the mouth, but he just gestures. And so Paul, responding after he's struck, rebukes whoever commanded that, not realizing it was the high priest of God, uh, which is, by the way, something that is, is Paul is quoting from in Exodus 22, verse 28. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. And so Paul acknowledges, I shouldn't have done that. I'm going against the law, even as I'm noting that you are going against the law by asking that to happen. But Paul meets the situation being immediately deferential, immediately apologetic when he unintentionally insults the high priest and goes against what an explicit command of scripture. Because you also see that everything that Paul is doing here is endeavoring to be conciliatory. He doesn't say when he's on trial, putting himself at opposition. How does he address the trial? He says right there in verse 1 of chapter 23, Brothers, I'm identifying with you. I'm one of you. We're thinking through these things. We have similar formative experiences. We should be all on the same page. And he does that again uh, later on in the passage in verse 6. He says, brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of the Pharisees. And he's trying to find connections. He's trying to find a sense of unanimity with those he's making this advocated case for. We live, friends, in a time where people speak harshly. We live in a in a context, in a society where we hear words like polarization and division. And a lot of times, even Christians, people who self-identify as followers of Christ, can fall into this and say that the Bible is actually enabling their hostility. We see even here, I think, that there are times for Christians to speak with confidence and maybe even harshness and directness But we also see when Paul does those things that he is quick to defer. He is not going to double down in his defensiveness, double down in his anger and rage like we often see people doing. Maybe sometimes we ourselves have even done in situation. We must purpose to speak with confidence but always be open to correction when God's word tells us that's what we should do. We must recognize that when we use words that are pointed and sharp, if we are shown to be in error or we are shown that we are maybe overstepping politeness and consideration with others, we must be open to doing so, to being corrected in a thoughtful and intentional and friends, ultimately, because we are under control of the Holy Spirit. I think that's what Paul does here. He is working with the information that he has at the time. He is not omniscient. But when it's shown that there is something where you have crossed a line, he is opening himself up to being corrected. He is doing whatever he can to be polite, to be considerate of other people. Because as James tells us in James 1.19, we should be Quick to listen, quick to hear, but then slow to speak and slow to anger. It doesn't say we shouldn't ever get angry, but we should always make sure that we do that. We're not letting the anger control us. We we are maintaining our composure. We are maintaining control. Why? Because James says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. What is it called? What's the phrase that we use? 
when we allow ourselves often to get angry, we lost our temper. We lost our cool. Why do we use that as a description? Because we've lost control. There's ways that you should be able to be angry, to be reacting to a situation that needs that kind of emotion, that kind of sensation in you, but not let it take over your actions. To have a sense of rage, but have controlled rage. Okay, there's a problem. I am not happy with this. We're going to go after this. But it's not going to let things unleash. So now you're just letting it go, letting it fly, saying things that now you're going to have to apologize for later because you were out of control. Allow God to give you the filling of His Spirit, to be under the control of the Spirit. And so being courteous, being considerate of somebody else, will lead you ultimately to be under the Spirit's control, the Spirit's direction, and enable you to finally be consistent. It is going to not be because you have learned this on your own. It's going back to what we talked about earlier with Paul being equipped, enabled by God's Spirit. And friend, that's where we learn this as well. Walk by the Spirit, Paul says in Galatians 5.16, and you will not gratify. You won't give in to the desires of the flesh. Let God's Spirit control you. How does God's Spirit control us? It's through His Word. It's through the information that we have up here that processes out into how we live. As many are led by the Spirit of God, he says in Romans 8, 14, are the sons of God. Romans 8 is a, is a rich passage that talks to us about that, that we are not driven by the flesh anymore. We, those who are of the flesh cannot please God. All those desires that are going in there. But you are not on the flesh. You have the Spirit. You don't have to live that way. Paul, to summarize what he's saying, is the point that he's making that. So to be following the Spirit is not how we sometimes popularly conceive about it in American evangelicalism, that we just have this sense of energy and, and, and presence and something otherworldly that just gives us some sense of ecstasy and experience. You might have some of that. I'm not going to say there's never a time where we can experience the presence of God. But that's not what we should be looking for. How do we know we're controlled by the Spirit? We look for the fruit. Galatians 5.22. What is that fruit? How are we living? How do we know we're under control? We look for love. We look for joy. We look for peace. And not again serenity and calmness, but peace maybe in the ending of conflict and hostility. We're looking to bring peace and cease the conflict. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And Paul says there's no, nothing illegal about any of that. That's how we should be living. That's what should dominate our life choices. That's how we know we're under control of the, in the Spirit. So, he says this again, building it. You've heard this, talking about music. He says in Ephesians 5.19, You address one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart, giving thanks always into everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. And that verse 18 says, that's how you're filled with the Spirit. You're not drunk with wine. You're not out of control. You do all these things, but then listen to what he says. You're filled with the Spirit. You're under control of the Spirit, not just by singing and having this grand corporate experience. You're giving thanks for everything to God. And you're submitting to each other. Verse 21. Why? Not because the other people are doing what they should do. So now that's what we all get along with. If they'll just think like me. No. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be times where you're not always operating on the same page. But he says you submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. That's what you'll, it will mean. That's what it will look like when we are filled by the Spirit. He's equipped you to get along, even when the other people 
aren't holding up their sense of the load, even when the other people aren't being consistent, God calls you, brother or sister, to be faithful, to be consistent when everybody else has stopped. And this is what Paul had to be reminded of here at the, at the end of our passage this morning. Keep plugging away. Keep moving on. I have equipped you. I'm not abandoning you. My truth hasn't changed. So you keep living the way that I have empowered you to do. And Christian, it's not impossible because He will not leave you. He will hold you fast. If it ever feels like, Christian, that you can't do this, that it's impossible, remember, with God, all things are possible. So the point that you should remember as we conclude our message this morning is that yes, Christian, throughout the challenges, throughout the difficulty, you should live the life that God has equipped you to live. Before your salvation, you were dead in your sins, without God, abandoned in the world. But Jesus died so that whoever believes in Him will not be dead any longer, will not perish, but instead has eternal life. And He has died so that you could have life and life more abundantly. He wants you to live the life that He has equipped you to live. The life that He says, yet not I, but now Christ lives in me. Will you let Him do the work? Will you do the work He's called you to do?